Hello, Andre W. And this time I've got an item for repair, or at least possible repair, because of course we don't know uh, whether it's actually going to be repairable or not. Now, let's have a look at the item, and uh, here it is. It's actually a computer monitor, and this is a pretty old one. It's actually a Commodore branded monitor, though whether they actually made it or not is another matter. It may well have been made by some other manufacturer. And this is probably sort of 20 plus years old. Could even be older than that. So uh, anyway, this apparently doesn't work, and uh, we're just going to have a quick look to see uh, what the problem is. Hopefully, uh, actually get the thing repaired and working. So here's the thing, and uh, so this is a Commodore branded thing, although they probably didn't actually make it. It was more likely made by some other manufacturer of this stuff, and then just branded up with the appropriate label. Uh, model here is a 1084ST or 1084ST. Doesn't appear to be a particularly common one, and it's one of the later ones. Sort of towards the end of the uh, Commodore era, and I've got the front here just headphone sockets and presumably a power indicator. And if you have a look inside this little door here, uh, we've got various controls here. So we've got volume, color, contrast, brightness, H phase, obviously horizontal phase, and we've got a switch here which is from RGB to uh, composite. So we just switch it over to whatever. Now these do appear to rotate, so. Uh, in terms of physical destruction, at least that's uh, fairly promising. So I've got no history on this at all, other than the fact it doesn't operate. So, so a quick look around the thing. No physical damage to the casing there. So here's a look at the back, and we've got the power switch there, so it seems to operate. And a little connector there, just the standard uh, mains input. Three controls here, so vertical size, and that does appear to rotate fairly well. Vertical shift, position I suppose that would be. And then horizontal width. Now this one seems to have a sort of a uh, pull in and out kind of arrangement, which isn't uh, going to be quite right. It does turn, but it's incredibly stiff, so maybe a problem there. Uh, signal input's got the RGB input there for the uh, video in, and then we've got audio in here, which uh, is a bit bizarre considering it's only got a headphone socket. It doesn't appear to have any speakers or anything on the sides. And then we've got the uh, composite input on the uh, two sockets here. This is one of these weird things that only Commodore really did on these. So you've basically got uh, the Luma and Chroma on separate connectors. It's a bit unusual, but uh, Commodore machines uh, generally did have that as an option. So uh, all uh, fairly standard there. And so the model is a 1084 ST. It's a 220 or 240 volt model uh, made in Malaysia in this particular case. Now, of course, the headset here do not open. So of course, we're going to be ignoring that and opening it up straight away. Because obviously there's not much more we can see without actually looking inside. Now I'll say this thing isn't mine and I don't have any history on it, particularly in terms of uh, where it's been or what it's been doing over its lifespan, other than it doesn't work. So I think we'll just turn it on anyway and power it up. I've turned the switch on on the back, so uh, let's see if it does anything. And uh, power's on there, but uh, nothing happening there, no power, no indicator, obviously no uh, high voltage either, so I can't hear or see anything. So uh, it certainly doesn't work, but of course uh, that's kind of what we already knew, as that was the uh, ported fault from the person who owns it. Now being in the UK, of course, all uh, main sleeves have a fuse in them, this one no exception, and the thing has not blown the fuse, so at least we know there's no kind of short circuit or other major catastrophe happening inside. It's just the fact that the power's going in, and it's not actually doing anything once it goes in there. So uh, at least that's something. It's not uh, sort of completely shorted out or something inside, so and that's a reasonably promising indication. Now just four screws that hold the uh, back on, basically two here and two underneath, so just remove the back and see what's going on inside. So case-wise it's pretty clean, there's a bit of dust there, but there's nothing uh, horribly arced or burnt on that. So here's a look inside the thing, and fairly typical for this sort of thing. We've basically got the uh, main tube here, high voltage connection there on the back. And then uh, underneath we've got the main circuit board underneath the whole of the uh, thing there. And then we've got a smaller board here on the back of the tube. And there's just the tube socket here, just plugs in on the back there. And this one also has this extra little board over on the side here. But uh, again, fairly uh, generic and typical for these sorts of things. The tube in this one is actually made by Philips. Again, pretty common manufacturer of these things. Of course, they obviously don't make these anymore. Now, so power was getting into this, and it hasn't blown the fuse in the actual mains lead, so certainly mains power was actually getting into this point. And uh, rather than just sort of dig through this and test every component, I think the first thing is really just have a quick look around, see if there's anything obviously that's uh, sort of failed, or exploded, burnt, or overheated, or whatever. 
and uh, having had a look through this here, nothing uh, abundantly obvious, so uh, so there's nothing sort of blown up or uh, set on fire. So that's a reasonably good sign, because say generally if something sort of burnt or whatever, it might suggest there's a fairly major problem. Now let's close the view of the corner here. This is actually the main switch uh, just on the back here, so there's two wires there with the black heat shrink, and then the power inlet is this thing here. So basically it's just coming in there via the switch and then onto the board itself. So uh, we'll just check that the switch is actually working because of course a busted switch would be a very obvious thing. So uh, that's actually in the off position, so if we just turn that uh, to the on position there, and we can just check continuity between the two pins, so we should have continuity there. And as you can see there we do, so the switch is fine. And then the other thing, there's a fuse just down here, so yeah, we'll just check to see if that's blown or not. Again, obviously that would indicate a, uh, some kind of problem. So let's just get down into there. And the fuse is intact, so uh, we know that power's getting through into the actual thing. If the fuse had blown then that would be an indication that there is another fault on the board. Certainly not recommended just to shove a new fuse in and hope because fuses don't blow normally for no reason. So a blown fuse would indicate say, a short circuit or something on the board, but in this case fuse and switch are fine. Now because this thing has absolutely no sign of life whatsoever, then the fault is going to be most likely in this power supply section on this side. Uh, clearly if there was some problem with the rest of it, we would at least see say the power indicator coming on and might uh, see there's other things uh, operating like the uh, screen or whatever else, but uh, as there's absolutely nothing, it's going to be on the power supply side here, so we don't have to be particularly looking at this piece here, or pretty much anything over that side at the moment, or this little one over this side, so it's going to be over here. Now, people seem to like replacing capacitors in these old things, and it's always the case that capacitors are always the things that have failed, and uh, if you look at any other YouTube video you'll see that uh, it's every time it's capacitors, and all you have to do with any old piece of equipment is simply open it up, pull out all the capacitors and put brand new ones in, and then it's as good as new. Of course that's a load of nonsense because uh, yes, capacitors can fail and they do quite often, but clearly they're not the only things which will fail, and there's plenty of other stuff which can cause stuff to not work. Now in these cases we've got a fair number of these capacitors here, they don't particularly look bulged or uh, destroyed there, and uh, so another couple here in the uh, section here. So uh, we're not going to be doing that, we're going to find out actually what the problem is. Now this is just a side-on view. And uh, I don't have a schematic for this or anything, and I'm not particularly inclined to go look for one at this stage because these are generally relatively simple things. It's all on one board, and say so this is a fairly modern thing as these things go, so it shouldn't be uh, too much bother. And say so basically we're looking for something wrong in the power supply. Now we've got the mains coming in here, we've got the green and yellow going over to the uh, case on the top there. Neutral and blue just goes down onto the board, and then the line comes through onto the switch here, and then from the switch again just down via there and of course for that fuse which we uh, just tested, so we know the power's getting up to that point. Now the rest of this here is going to be uh, filtering mainly, it's going to be a choke and some uh, capacitors there. None of those are going to cause it to stop working, say if one of these had shorted it would have taken out the fuse or whatever, and again the capacitors, uh, well, obviously going to be a bit old, sort of 25 years old or whatever, but uh, again they're not uh, a complete failure. This is a bridge rectifier here, that could have failed open, but uh, again, it's fairly unlikely, and again, it hasn't sort of blown up and uh, smoked out or whatever, so again, we'll move on from that. Uh, these look like uh, metal oxide resistors, so sort of surge protection or whatever. Again, these can fail in power supplies, and when they do, they generally split open and uh, black mess pours out of them, and they almost always blow the fuse when they fail. And this here will be the actual transformer, and from the size of it, this is going to be a switching type power supply, because if this was operating at 50 hertz, it would be a much bigger and much heavier thing, but uh, considering its tiny size, then we're definitely looking at a switching supply. And this will here will be the switching circuitry over here. And we've got here a little uh, transistor there, or probably a transistor, and a single chip there, that 8-pin job, which no doubt is the uh, power supply controller. And then the rest here, just a few capacitors and resistors and things, just to go with that. Also a uh, just a to pop there, so possibly to set the uh, voltage or whatever, but certainly we're not going to be uh, twisting that. So I'm going to suspect something in this area. This transistor device here is a prime culprit, and the actual driver chip itself, this one down here. Now this transistor could be at fault, so let's just check uh, what we've got here. Let's we'll check whether the uh, case is connected to one of the tabs. So the middle prong there is connected to the case, which is fairly typical for these. 
Now we can actually get to the terminals underneath, which is somewhat easier. So I'm going to put the probe right through the hole of the board there. So uh, we can just go on to the case, which is the middle pin there. Let's see, we've got that before. And if we go to the side pin, we're getting there voltage drop about 0.5, so that would seem uh, reasonable. And if we go to the other pin there, we're getting about 1.5 or 1.6 volts. So again, that doesn't seem uh, too out of the ordinary. So I don't actually know what this is. I can't read the number because the uh, side of the case is in the way. But uh, nevertheless, that's not uh, unexpected. And if we check it in the other direction, again, it's showing uh, open. And the other pin, that's the middle. And then the third pin, again, it's basically open. So though we don't know what that actually is, and we can't actually read it because that's taking the board out, then uh, we already know that it's going to be highly likely working. It's showing up as basically a diode on the two other pins there, or a couple of diodes. And then it's showing as open circuit on the other side. So that's fine. Generally, when these things fail, they will either fail completely open, so you have it open in both directions, or they go short. In which case, of course, it shows a short circuit between one or more of the pins, and it's not doing that. So, again, we can uh, fairly safely conclude that that is not the problem. Now, just doing a quick check on the other components here, and it's basically just a question of using the diode check function on the multimeter just across the various items. And uh, certainly, obviously, the uh, semiconductor should show up as diode in one direction and not in the other. Basically, the same as we had on that transistor device there. And uh, resistors, of course, should measure some kind of resistance and capacitors should have some sort of capacitance there. And although these are actually in circuit, you will normally get some kind of reading across them. And the key thing you're looking for, you don't want things to be completely open. So say a resistor was showing sort of open circuit, clearly it's failed. Or something was showing a short circuit, again, clearly that's not right either. None of these show any of those things, so they're all uh, having sort of fairly credible values on those. So it really comes down to this chip in the middle here, this TDA4605. I had a quick look on that. It's actually a switch mode controller, so that's no surprise there, really. It's uh, fairly obvious what it is from its position on the board there. So I think the most likely culprit is that uh, particular chip there. So uh, what I'll do is get another one of those, uh, just put that in there instead of that one. They're only a couple of pounds each, so uh, there's no particular cost involved there. And to say the rest of it, uh, some of the capacitors might be old and whatever, but uh, they certainly shouldn't prevent it from working. Now I've replaced the 8-pin chip there. And I say there's not really much else in there that uh, appear to have failed, so that should be the one. So I've just plugged it in again with the uh, main switch in the on position, and we'll just turn it on and see if we get anything different. So we've definitely got some life there, the power's on, and we've got some kind of uh, colouring or image on the screen there, just sort of a dull grey. Got a bit of uh, sparking on the back there. Oh, we hear that just clicking away. That's probably the uh, high voltage just clicking away to something there. We'll uh, check into that in a moment. But uh, it's nice to say it does uh, mostly appear to be uh, doing something now. So obviously got the uh, power going in. Now although it was working, there was that sort of uh, crackling noise which uh, might have suggested there's something uh, arcing around in the back here. And the easy way to check that is to turn off the light. So it's completely dark and then just have a look because if there's anything sparking or arcing of course that would be fairly obvious now how about done that wasn't anything uh, apparently obvious that was uh, burning away or sparking so it's probably the fact that it's just got a bit damp or something as it's been uh, stored away somewhere for quite some time now another feature with these things which uh, you may well have uh, heard of is that if you put your fingers in the back of here then it's instant death within three seconds because there's two billion volts stored inside but of course that's not true at all but what is true is that there is uh, certainly dangerous voltages inside, and certainly when the thing's turned on, the uh, cup on the back of here typically has voltage in the tens of thousands of volts range, sort of 15 to 25,000 volts will be fairly common. Obviously you don't put your fingers there when it's turned on. And then the other thing is that uh, you may have also heard that uh, these things can store huge amounts of electrical charge for years afterwards. They're turned off and of course that's extremely dangerous. Well, yeah, that's partially true. The thing that stores electrical charge, of course, is capacitors, of which there's a fair number in the bottom there. And of course, the bigger the capacitor, then the bigger the charge that's stored there. Now, in the terms of the capacitors in this one, there's quite a few on the board, which we saw previously. All of those are fairly small. But the biggest capacitor in equipment like this is actually the tube itself, because what this is is a glass tube. On the inside, there's a conductive coating. 
And then on the outside, there's also a conductor coating, which is this darker coloured material here, and also over this side here. So the tube itself is actually a giant capacitor. And of course, being in mind that there's sort of 25,000 volts or something being applied here, then that is the one which can store a fairly substantial amount of charge, even when the thing has been turned off. Fortunately, though, this is easy to deal with. Now, most equipment has uh, bleeder resistors installed so that uh, when the thing is turned off, a resistor somewhere on there basically drains away any charge that's on the tube. So if it's been turned off for more than half a minute or something, highly likely there's no charge left. But uh, just in case there is, and of course those resistors may not be present in some older equipment, and of course they may have failed, then all you need to do is basically uh, just bridge between the actual connection here and the ground. Now we're going to just use this lead here, and what we're going to do is clip onto the ground, which is basically the outside of the tube, and we'll see here there's this uh, black lead coming on here, that's actually the ground connection, and then we've got this sort of braided bit, and it also twists around the top here. So what we can do is just clip onto the uh, bit of the braid up the top there, and just got a normal screwdriver here, just going to uh, clip onto this, and then under here is a metal contact, so all we're going to do is take this and then put it underneath the cup there, until it gets to the middle. Now there was no actual uh, click or spark there, so this has obviously been discharged pretty much already. If there had been any charge there, then you would have heard a slight sort of pop or click as the uh, thing was discharged. So that's pretty much it. No mystery involved. There was some horrendous video I saw actually a few years ago now where some idiots were going around with rubber gloves on, all kinds of other stupidity, but uh, absolutely ridiculous. Now, as this may have got a bit damp or something, there was that sort of minor crackling going on on the back there. What I think we'll do is take this off, and then we'll just clean underneath, see if there's any moisture or any dust or mess that's got under there. And also just give the actual leaves a bit of a clean as well. Now, uh, these things are rubber, so uh, just a question of peeling back the uh, rubber coating there. And underneath, you see, there's basically just a metal clip thing which goes into a hole. So to uh, remove, then just pull that back, and then it's a question of just squeezing the metal clip there and then that will just remove from there like that so there you see the metal prongs there sort of spring loaded and they just go into this hole here on the back of the tube now of course this is not a hole that goes inside the tube this is just a small recess and then there's obviously more glass underneath this basically just connects to the conductive coating on the inside so obviously it's not that hole that you can uh, put things through and uh, whatever because this bag is under vacuum so that's what's under one of them. No particular mystery involved there. Just simply a metal connection clip, and then the wire comes off the back here, goes down to the uh, transformer there. So we'll uh, just give this a bit of a wipe, and we'll just use some of this uh, IPA here. Yes, the nozzle's busted off because it, uh, it's a piece of junk, but uh, we'll just use a uh, implement to uh, get some of that out of there. So I'll just get some of that on there, and we'll just give this area here clean away. You don't want to go over onto the black because that's actually a coating which uh, is conductive. We don't actually want to be removing that obviously. And also inside the hole there's a conductive coating as well so uh, obviously avoid going in there. If this coating gets damaged you can actually buy it. Well at least you used to be able to buy it in bottles and just uh, paint it on but uh, not sure whether you can still get that. Then it will just clean around there completely because what we don't want any arcing from here to there because obviously that would cause uh, undesired operation. So that's all cleaned up and this uh, knot in it by the way is just to shorten the length of it so that when it's uh, actually installed it's as short as possible because you're now sort of flapping around and uh, getting damaged against sharp edges or whatever and doesn't have any uh, electrical function. So uh, replacement is just the reverse of uh, removal. Basically these go into there and just a question of squeezing those together and then just releasing once they're inside the hole. So uh, in theory on some of these you can squeeze through the cup itself but but this generally is just to peel that back and then you can see exactly what you're doing. So we'll uh, just uh, reinstall that into the back of there and then the cup just uh, flaps back down over the top. Now I just put the back on, uh, at least temporarily, may have to come off again, and uh, connected up the signal generator here, just made up a uh, lead because we didn't have the correct one for this. And uh, we've got some kind of an image here. Now, as you see, there are a few problems with this. And I've adjusted the controls here on the front and also the back, and this is about as good as it currently gets. Now what this is supposed to be is a circle in the middle, another circle outside, and then one circle in each of the corners. And we can see there's a couple of problems here. This bottom corner is not too bad, although the positioning is incorrect, it should be further down and to the right. The top half of the screen is sort of skewed across like that, 
and the entire image is actually too wide because we're only seeing half the circle here. That should be uh, basically another square in on the left side there. So uh, certainly some adjustments are required. Now all the controls do seem to do what they're supposed to do, apart from that one on the back, which was that uh, one that was a bit broken we saw at the beginning. So uh, turning that appears to do nothing, but given the fact it was bust, that's not entirely surprising. In terms of colour, then it is all there. So we have all of the uh, colours here. Now again, the white is hanging off the screen here on the left. And of course, uh, that's the same for all of the images, but uh, all the colours are there. And if we just go to a uh, solid colour there, that's uh, white there. So there's your red only. That's the green only. And there's the blue, and obviously the combinations of the uh, cyan there, the yellow, and the magenta. So all the colours are there. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this skew at the top there, so that's the dots circle we've seen before, the colour bars we just saw there, and the uh, staircase, as it's called on this machine, which is just basically radiated from one side to the other. Again, it's the same problem with the uh, skew on the top, as you can see. So uh, the tube is okay, but uh, unfortunately, the uh, adjustments inside most definitely are not. And again, there's some text there. Again, fine at the bottom, but uh, knackered on the top edge. So, uh, yeah, it's not uh, a total disaster, but certainly uh, further adjustments required. Now, in terms of the uh, adjustments here, the only one which makes any real adjustment to the picture is this H phase knob here, which, as you can see, if we turn it to the right and the left, it sort of uh, twists the picture around in a rather undesirable fashion, but uh, it doesn't actually matter either end of the scale, it's the same uh, distortion at the top here and again the width is far too wide again we're sort of uh, although it does shift it across the screen the width itself is still too fat so uh, not uh, desperately successful there contrast there that's sort of full and that's at minimum and then the brightness basically minimum to uh, far too much so we've got the decent uh, range on those controls there so mostly working, but clearly there are some issues with the actual uh, circuits inside. No doubt some of those old capacitors may need replacing, and there may be some other adjustments inside which are not accessible from the outside. But uh, as this video has gone along quite long enough already, what we're going to do is leave it here, and then in the part two we're going to have a look at the insides of this, hopefully uh, get the rest of that working. But uh, until then, thanks for watching.